No, you don't want to see a project from last year. You really don't want to see a project from last year. Last year's projects were not great. It's the same as any other project you're ever going to do. You're doing science. If you're expecting your science is going to look like somebody else's science, then you're going to not be ever published in your life because you're going to be done for plagiarism. On the Padlet is a list of potential questions, which I've got 19 so far, and I haven't strained my brain very much to think of more. Depending on which one you picked of these would define how your project is going to look, because each question is solved in a completely different way. So I can't tell you what a project looks like. It looks like the solution to one of these problems. Or one of the other problems that we'll come up with by thinking about them. So if I'm going to do a project, let's think about this first one. So this is an idea for a project. So this is purely theoretical don't necessarily need to go and get any data at all. So the question is, how do we get antigenic shift? So how do we go from having uh, small incremental changes to suddenly having massively big changes in the virus so that suddenly it becomes much more dangerous to us? So what do you think could happen? Actually, you can collect some data to have a look at it. Ideas? Transfer of genetic material between viruses. I don't know they do. Mm, it's possible. Big viruses, things like hepatitis might do that. Yeah, no, I think definitely there are some shared proteins and genes between some different viruses. How could you do that? Same virus infecting different hosts is the most common. So let's go back and look at something in the database. So let's do another search in the database. <laughs> Mm, yeah. No, I don't really want to do that. Why do I do that? Right. What I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to go to get something out of the database. I'm going to get hemagglutinin. Where's hemagglutinin? AJ. I'm going to get H1 and H5 not H1, 2, H5. I just want H1 and H5. Um, and I'm going to put them with okay, N, N2. H, yeah, pretty much I think that'll work. I want full length. And then I'm going to show results. This is going to give me a lot of results, I suspect. Like Yes, many thousands. Oh, it's not giving me a warning. That's a bit worrying. So I've got H5N2 and H1N2. I don't want to select everything. I'm going to be so I so undo. Can't I deselect everything? Okay. I'm 
I hope it's unselecting everything and I'm disappointed as usual. No, 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 no. I want you to unselect everything. There's three and a half thousand sequences. Is a touch too much for my liking? <laughs> How can I restrict this to make less? So let's see whether that works and gets in. So if I'm doing it from 2018 to 2020, I get nothing. What? How can that be true? That in 2018 to 2020, there's nothing. Very weird. 2010 to 2020. Uh, see, now I get everything. It's like, I care. 2015 to 2020. Still a thousand. But once I get to 2018 to 2020, I get nothing. How's that possible that I go from thousands? That's better. I've got 87. And the problem is there's not a single H5 in there. Oh, you're such an annoyance. See, normally when you click on that button, it all disappears. Right, I'll get one H5 from there and uh, H1 from there and download it. Actually, download. So I've got three or four, or how many? I've got four H uh, ones from there. So if I go back and I do my H5, and N anything, there's only one H5 in all that time. What are you talking about? Is there only one H5 that's in the sequence database since 2017? Are you joking? How can there only be one H5? That means nobody's been collecting any data for the last five years. I can understand the last year and a half, but what on earth have they been doing since then? Flu can't just disappear like that. Uh. So if I go back to 2015, that will load 481. Don't want that many. I just want about four or five. So let's switch off that in general. Now cancel Go away. Right. Okay. I just want some and then let's download those so i've got two faster files faster one and faster two if i go to my downloads i've got these two files now this is why i told you you need an editor so i'm going to open the first file in the editor uh, notepad plus plus open second one in the editor and i'm just quite simply going to cut the file out of the sequences out of one and paste them into the other. Did I paste them? No, probably I didn't. Because oh, I can't remember. Oh, yes, I did. Okay. So I've now got all my sequences combined together and I can resave it. So in that faster file, I've now got a mixture of H5s and H1s. So if I open this file, this change it to dot fas so that mega recognizes it automatically oh, 
I also want to get rid of. This is when I've got an H5 and an H1. So the first thing I need to do is definitely do some alignment. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, do the alignment. Okay, done. Now I've got loads of stars on the top in some places and I haven't in others. You can clearly see a gap between what sequences you have in the top ones, which are all the H1s, and the bottom ones, which are all the H5s. Like it hasn't even got the start code on <laughs> correctly aligned because it's spending so much time trying to get that uh, lysine aligned. They do have a lot in common because they fold to the same shape, roughly. But when you sequence alignment, they just look terrible. And you get insertions in the middle of the sequence, insertions and deletions, and the alignment just stinks. So between these four sequences, that's antigenic drift. Between those four sequences and these four sequences, that's antigenic shift. So what's happening that creates such a drastic amount of changes that I go from one particular sequence to the other? That means I've got large scale changes in the DNA. And then again, I have little bits like this where I can't afford to have changes at all. So this tells you that this bit is doing something really, really, really important. If this changes in any way, it stops this working at all. So that bit plus this bit, where it's the same across all of the different subtypes, so pretty much this entire block here, this is important for the function of hemagglutinin. The rest of it is padding. So there's another bit here that's really important. So it's identical, and then there's areas where there's loads of changes. At the ends, there tends to be a certain amount of change because it doesn't matter. Here, there's loads of change in this region, then the absolute end is conserved again. So this bit's got to be doing something. 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 And this bit's got to be doing something. It's got an ICI on it again, because they're conserved. Evolution can't change these bits, it can change other things. So what kind of processes are happening to get such drastic changes and define these two different groups? Do you think it happens by changing one amino acid and uh, one amino acid, one base at a time? Probably not, especially these insertion bits. So those two are insertions of ones, which is just a change of three nucleotides. But somewhere we've got a change here, which is a change of three, which is a change of nine nucleotides. So there's a perfectly conserved proline there. And then it's come, well, it's perfectly conserved arginine and uh, glycine there and then there's a kind of mess in between it so this one has lots of basic amino acids in it and this one doesn't really have a lot of charge on it, it has some polar things but not a lot of charge now if i look at the dna for this particular region i'm betting that the dna sequence is very repetitive so it might go AAT, AAT, AAT. Whereas the ones here, I'm betting they don't have that repeat. Or if they do, it's broken up in some way. 
So what's going to happen when you copy your DNA, or in this case, RNA, and you've got a region which goes AAT, AAT, AAT. So you're halfway through that region doing your copy and something goes wrong in doing the copying thing. So the polymerase falls off. So they have pre-freeding mechanisms so they can attach themselves back on. But what's most likely to happen? If I've got three AATs in a row, what's going to be the problem for the polymerase when it attaches again? Because it knows it fell off on an AAT. Yeah, so what it can do is attach in the wrong place of that of that set of AATs. And what you get is elongations of repeat regions. So any region which has a lot of very simple sequence is susceptible to more change than regions which don't have lots of sequ uh, lots of simple sequence. So actually, to answer this particular question about how do we get antigenic shift and how do we get antigenic drift, the kind of thing you'd think about doing with bioinformatics tools is getting different hemagglutinins, looking at their conserved regions and change regions, and trying to come up with mechanisms which explain how those variable bits can change, looking at single nucleotide changes, looking at changes between host species, looking at changes in repeat length, looking to see if you take some of those regions in DNA and you blast them against other species, if there could be, uh, the virus could be picking up small segments of DNA from other species. So there's loads of different experiments and things you can try out to see what's happening and to try and understand this problem. So that's what you'd need to do for your project. First thing you need to do is come up with some ideas about what process could be happening. And then you'd have to come up with some experiments or some simulations to show what could be involved. So you can do that by collecting existing data and saying, look, these are the processes that have happened. This is what we think is causing the changes. And then you can build some models, some simulations to see if that works. And then you can collect together loads of literature and other people's ideas about what could be happening. That was the reason for me giving you the papers I did in the folder that I have. If you were able to reproduce any of the kind of studies, but not reproduce, produce an original study which is similar to the studies that I showed you in those papers, that is a good project. So there's one paper which is about trying to devise a nomenclature for SARS. How can you devise a nomenclature? You see in the news now that they're talking about the, the British mutation or the South African mutation or the Brazilian mutation. But now it seems that the British mutation has now also got the South African mutation. So did that happen because the British mutation mutated again to become the South African one? Or did it happen that the South African one got here and it uh, simultaneously mutated to have the British mutation? Or how does both of them arrive separately? 
But if they're both arriving separately from a, a different ancestry to get to the same place, so what do you have? You have a South African mutation, you have a British mutation, and you have some sequences that have both of them. But what's the ancestor? The British one or the South African one? Or neither of them, and suddenly the virus evolved again and put both of them on at the same time. Another question, why a virus is seasonal? I don't know. So this is about really racking your brains and brainstorming. So remember your granny used to tell you, don't go out if you've got wet hair, otherwise you'll get a cold. So my brother being the kind of person that my brother is, he just likes upsetting people. So he's going, that's nonsense. A cold is a rhinovirus or another kind of virus. And me putting a towel on my head to dry my hair doesn't change anything to do with me being more or less exposed to a virus. He's right. So why do we get more colds and flu in the winter? So therefore, science come up with its next hypothetical reason why this happens. So the next hypothetical reason is in the winter, we spend more time indoors than we do in the summer. So because we spend all that time indoors, it allows the coughs and colds to spread more cleanly from one person to another because there's way more contact. Yeah, I can understand that. I can think back to the medieval times when we'd all be out in the field scattering our crops and ploughing and doing everything else and working for his lordship in the manor and then harvesting all our corn and doing whatever else so that we weren't ever indoors from probably about March until September. We spent a lot of time outside. But that's total and utter nonsense in the modern society. It's garbage. We spend as much time sitting in an office chair in front of a computer in the summer as the winter, as the autumn, as any other day. So why do we have a flu season? None of the existing explanations make sense if you think about them. So what's the answer? Any ideas? Could be changes in vitamin D. Unfortunately, if you live in the UK, you've got no chance. Practically, the sun's only high enough to get enough vitamin D exposure to the amount you actually need from about April onwards. You're messed up otherwise. But then people should take vitamin D as a supplement and we should see the amount of colds go down. Do we? Has anyone done the experiment? Exactly. So you can always think of new things to answer these questions. You can think of possibilities. So for this one, you'd need to go and look at the literature as to possible explanations. Mm. One possible theory is mucus droplets last on surfaces much longer in winter than in summer. So this increases the transmission rates. But it's such a small increase in transmission rates. It doesn't quite seem right to me, but anyway. It's certainly true to, a set, to an extent. But if that's true, you would expect to see less flu cases in tropical regions. The closer to the equator you are, you shouldn't see colds and 
influenza as common as you do. So you'd have to look at public health data to look at that. But that's what I want with your project. And that's why you're in groups, because I want you bouncing around ideas and trying to solve genuine problems in science. I want you to be actually doing science and being scientists. So people say, well, how do I know I'm right or not? You don't. But as I said, with Linus Pauling said, he had so many good ideas because he had so many bad ones. You will not fail your project because you've come up with this, with an answer that fails to be correct. What I'm looking for is process. I'm looking for, have you gone about it in a sensible, rational way? Come up with a reasonable idea that has some possibility for success, collected the data in a reasonable way and investigated it as well as you could. Even if it turns out to be completely wrong as an idea, you can still get first class, you can still get 80 or 90%, so long as you followed a reasonable path. So long as it was a rational thing to do, you read the evidence properly and you made a plan. You fail just if you don't do the required amount of work and put in the right amount of effort and do the right amount of critical thinking. 